Chapter 10. We have dropped in for a good job. Eight of us have to be have to guard a village that has been abandoned because it's being shelled too heavily. In particular, we have to watch the supply dump, as, it, as that is not empty yet. We are supposed to provision ourselves from that same store. We are just the right people for that. Cat, Albert, Muller, Tiaden, Dietering, the whole gang is there. Hai is dead, though. We were mighty lucky all the same. All the other squads have, have had many more cal casualties than we have. We select, as a dugout, a reinforced concrete cellar into which steps lead down from above. The entrance is protected by a separate concrete wall. Now we must, now we develop an immense industry. This is an opportunity not only to stretch one's legs, but to stretch one's soul also. We make the best use of such opportunities. The war is too desperate to allow us to be sentimental for long. That is only possible so long as things are not, go uh, are not going too badly. After all, we cannot afford to be anything but matter of fact. So matter of fact indeed that I often shudder when a thought, come, a thought from the days before the war comes momentarily into my head, but it does not stay long. We have to take things as lightly as we can, so we make the most of every opportunity and nonsense stands stark and immediate behind, beside horror. It cannot be otherwise, that is how we harden ourselves. So we zealously set to work to create an ideal, an ideal of eating and sleeping, of course. The first floor is covered with mattresses, which we haul from the, from the houses. Even the soldiers behind likes to sit soft. Only in the middle of the floor is there any, any queer space. Then we furnish ourselves with blankets, eiderdowns, luxurious soft affairs. There's plenty of everything to be had in the village. Albert and I find a mahogany bed, which can be taken to pieces with a sky, with a sky of blue silk and a lace coverlet. We sweat like monkeys moving it in, but a man cannot let a thing like that slip, and it would be certainly shot to pieces in a day or two. Cat and I do a little patrolling through the houses. In a very short time, we have collected a dozen eggs and two pounds of fairly fresh butter. Suddenly, there's a crash in the drawing room. And an iron stove hurtles through the wall past us and on a yard from us out to the wall behind two holes it comes from the house opposite where where a shell has just landed the swine grimaces cat and we continue to we continue our search all at once we prick our ears hurry across and suddenly stand petrified there running up and down in a, in a little sty are two live suckling pigs we rub our eyes and look once again to make certain yes they're still there we seize hold of them, no doubt about it, two really young pigs. This will be a grand feed. About 20 yards from our dugout, there's a small house that was used as an officer's billet. In the kitchen is an immense fireplace with two ranges, pots, pans, and kettles, everything, even to a stack of small chopped wood in an, out, in an outhouse, a regular cook's paradise. Out of our two fellows have been at. Two of our fellows have been out in the fields all morning hunting for potatoes, carrots, and green peas. You're quite uppish and sniff about the tin stuff and the supply dump. We want fresh vegetables. In the dining room, there are already two heads of cauliflower. The suckling pigs are slaughtered. Cat sees to them. We want to make potato cakes to go with the roast, but we cannot find a grater for the potatoes. However, the difficulty is soon got over. With a nail, we punch a lot of holes in a pot lid, and there we have a grater. Three fellows put on thick gloves to protect their fingers against the grater. Two others peel the potatoes, and the business gets going. Cat takes charge of the suckling pigs, the carrots, the peas, and the cauliflower. He even mixes a white sauce. So oh, he even mixes a white sauce for the cauliflower. I fry the pancakes four at a time. After ten minutes, I get the knack of tossing the pan so that the pancakes, which are done on one side, sail up, turn in the air, and are caught again as they come down. The sucking pigs are roasted whole. We all stand round them as before an altar. In the meantime, we receive visitors, a couple of wireless men who are generously invited to the feed. They sit in the living room where there is a piano. One of them plays, the other sings, on der Weser. He sings feelingly, but with a rather Saxon accent. All the same, it moves us and we stand at the fireplace preparing the good things. Then we begin to realize we are in for trouble. The observation balloons have spotted the smoke from our chimney and the shells start to drop on us. Those are, they are those damn spraying little daisy cutters that make only a small hole and scatter widely close to the ground. They keep dropping closer and closer all around us. Still, we cannot leave the grub in the lurch. A couple of splinters whiz through the top of the kitchen window. The roast is ready, but frying the pancakes is getting difficult. The explosions come so fast that the splinters strike again and again against the wall of the house and sweep in through the window. 
never hear a shell coming. I drop down on one knee with the pan and the pancakes and duck behind the wall of the window. Immediately afterwards, I am up again and going on with the frying. The Saxon stops sing singing. A fragment has smashed the piano. At last, everything is ready, and we organize the transport of it back to the dugout. After the next explosion, two men dash across the 50 yards to the dugout with the pots of vegetables. We see them disappear. The next shot. Everyone ducks, and then two more trot off, each with a big can of the finest grade coffee, and reach the dugout before the next explosion. Then Cat and Crop sees the masterpiece, a big dish with the browns roasted sucking pigs. A screech, a knee end, and away they race in a way, they race over the 50 yards of open country. I stay to finish my last of, of my last four pancakes. Twice I've had to drop to the floor. After all, it means four pancakes more, and they are my favorite dish. Then I grab the plate with, with the great pile of cakes and squeeze myself behind the house door. A hiss, a crash, and I gallop off with the plate clamped against my chest with both hands. I'm almost in. There was a rising screech. I bound, run like a deer, sweep around the wall, Fragments clatter against the concrete. I tumble down the cellar steps. My elbows are skinned, but I have not lost a single pancake, nor even upset the plate. At two o'clock, we start the meal. It lasts till six. We drink coffee till half past six. Officer's coffee from the supply dump and smoke officer's cigars and cigarettes, also from the supply dump. Punctually at half past six, we begin supper. At 10 o'clock, we throw the bones of the suckling pig outside the door. Then there's cognac and rum also from the blessed supply dump. And once again, long, fat cigars with belly bands. Taden says that it lacks only one thing, girls from an officer's brothel. Late in the evening, we hear mewing. A little gray cat sits in the entrance. We entice it in and give it something to eat. That wakes up our, our appetites once more. Still chewing, we lie down to sleep. But the night is bad. We have eaten too much fat. Fresh baby pig is very gri griping to the bowels. There's an everlasting coming and going in the dugout. Two, three men with their pants down are always sitting about outside and cursing. I've been outside nine times myself. About four o'clock in the morning, we, we reach a record. All 11 men, guards and visitors, are squatting outside. Burning houses stand out like torches against the night. Shells lumber across and crash down. Munition columns tear along the street. On one side, the supply dump has been ripped open. In spite of all the flying fragments, the drivers of the, of the munition columns pour in like a swarm of bees and pounce on the bread. We let them have their own way. If we said anything, it would only mean a good hiding for us. So we go differently about it. We explain that we are on guard and so know our way about. We get hold of the tin stuff and exchange it for things we are short of. What, what does it matter anyhow? In a while, it will all be blown to pieces. For ourselves, we take some chocolate from the depot and eat it in slabs. Cat says it is good for loose bowels. Almost a fortnight passes, thus in eating, drinking, and roaming about. No one disturbs us. The village gradually vanishes under the shells, and we lead a charmed life. So long as any part of the supply dump still stands, we don't worry. We desire nothing better than to stay here until the end of the war. Tayden has become so fastidious that he only, that he only half smokes his cigars. With his nose in the air, he explains to us that he was brought up that way, and Cat is most cheerful. In the morning, his first call is, Emil, bring in the caviar and the coffee. We put on extraordinary airs. Every man treats the other as his valet, bounces him and gives him orders. There's something itching under my foot. Crop, my man, catch that louse at once, says Lear, poking out his leg at him like a ballet girl. And Albert drags him up the stairs by the foot. Tiaden, what? Stand at ease, Tiaden. And what's more, don't say what, say yes, sir. Now Tiaden. Tiaden retorts in the well-known phrase from Goethe's Gotts von Berlig, Berliggein, with which he is always free. After eight more days, we receive orders to go back. The palmy days are over. Two big motor lorries take us away. They are stacked high with planks. Nevertheless, Albert and I erect on top of our four, on top our four poster bed, complete with the blue silk canopy, mattress, and two lace coverlets. Behind it, at the head, is a stout, is a stowed bag full of the choicest edibles. We often dip into it and the tough ham sausages, the tins of liver sausages, the conserves, the boxes of cigarettes rejoices, rejoice our hearts. Each man has a bag to himself. Crop and I have rescued two big, arm, two big red armchairs as well. They stand inside the bed, and we sprawl back in them as, as in a theater box. Above us swells the silken cover like a bal baldequin. Each man has a long cigar in his mouth. 
and thus from aloft we survey the scene. Beside, between us stands a parrot cage that we found for the cat. She's coming with us and lies in the cage before her saucer of meat and purrs. Slowly the lorries roll down the road. We sing. Behind us shells are sending up fountains from the, from the now utterly abandoned village. A few days later, we are sent to evacuate a village. On the way, we meet the fleeting inhabitants trundling their goods and chattels along with them in wheelbarrows, in, per, in perambulators, and on their backs. Their figures are bent, their faces full of grief, despair, haste, and resignation. The children hold on to their mother's hands, and often an older girl leads the little ones who stumble onward and, and are forever looking backward. A few carry miserable looking dolls. All are silent as they pass, as they pass us by. We are marching in column. The French certainly will not fire on a town in which there are still inhabitants. But a few minutes later, the air screams, the earth heaves, cries ring out. A shell has landed among our rear squad. We scatter and fling ourselves down on the ground. But at that moment, I feel the instinctive alertness leave me, which hitherto has always made me do unconsciously the right thing under fire. The thought leaps up with a terrible throbbing fear. You are lost. In the next moment, a blow, a blow sweeps like a whip over my left leg. I hear Albert cry out. He is beside me. Get up, Albert, I yell, for, for we are lying unsheltered in the open field. He staggers up and runs. I keep beside him. We have to get over a hedge. It is higher than we are. Crap seizes a branch. I heave him up by the leg. He cries out. I give him a swing, and he flies over. With one bound, I follow him and fall into a ditch that lies behind the hedge. Our faces are smothered with duckweed and mud, but the cover is good. So we wade in up to our necks. Whenever a shell whistles, we duck our heads under the water. After we have done this a dozen times, I am exhausted. Let's get away or fall in and drown, groans Albert. Where's it got you, I ask him. In the knee, I think. Can you run? I think. Then out. We make for the ditch beside the road and stooping, run along it. The shelling follows us. The road leads towards the munitions dump. If that goes up, there won't be much, there won't be so much as a bootlace left of us. So we change our plan and run diagonally across the country. Albert begins to drag. You go, I'll come on after, he says, and throws himself down. I seize him by the arm and shake him. Up, Albert. If once you lie down, you'll never get any farther. Quick, I'll hold you up. At last we reach a small dugout. Crop pitches in and I bandage, I bandage him up. The shot is just a little above his knee. Take a look at myself. My trousers are bloody and my arm too. Albert binds up my, binds up my womb with, with his field dressing. Already he is no longer able to move his leg. And we both wonder how he managed to make to get this far. Fear alone made it possible. We should have run even if our feet had been shot off. We would have run on the stumps. I can crawl a little. I call out to a passing ambulance wagon which picks us up. It is full of wounded. There's an army medical lance corporal with it who sticks an anti-tetanus needle into our chests. At the dressing station, we arrange matters so that we, stay, that we lie side by side. They give us a thin soup, which we spoon down greedily and scornfully because we are accustomed to better times, but are hungry all the same. Now for home, Albert, I say. Let's hope so, he replies. I only wish I knew what I've got. The pain increases. The bandages burn like fire. We drink and drink one glass of water after another. How far above the knee am I hit, asks Crop. At least four inches, Albert, I answer. Actually, is perhaps one. I've made up my mind, he says after a while. If they take off my leg, I'll put an end to it. I won't go through life as a cripple. So we lie there with our thoughts and wait.